All right, I'm delighted to be joined on Off the Ball by one of the most recognisable faces and voices in English football. Kelly Cates is with us. How are you keeping, Kelly? Uh, very well, thank you. That's a nice introduction. It must be a bit weird, is it? Being one of the most recognisable faces I, yeah, but I'm on not, British though. TV. I'm the, no, I'm I'm not, because I'm a, a sort of background facilitator. That's, nah, that's my job. Nah, it's nah, not, nah, nah, nah. No, but it's, it but that's when true. When was the last time you walked into a pub and people didn't turn around and go, is that, is that what I think it is? No, I don't. But the thing is, I don't get that, because I think if, like, I think if people see me at football matches, then I make sense to them, because I'm in that sort of environment. And then when I'm at football matches, I'm always with more interesting people. So I don't really get that, because when I'm out and about, it's it, people don't make the connection, so it's all good. So you're not like, I think it was Gary Barlow who said he could go to the supermarket for the first time ever during COVID because he can wear masks and nobody recognizes them. <laughs> yeah, I've not, I've not reached Gary Barlow levels. <laughs> I've, uh, I've done that terrible thing. I've done uh, a lot of Googling of Kelly Cates. Uh, one of the main things I've learned, Kelly, yeah, you've never owned a football jersey. Uh, That's what Google I, tells well, me. I, well, I've never bought one, but I did okay. get given one... Um, when Scotland played England in 1999, I think it would be, um, I had a Scotland shirt then. And it was the, I don't know if you remember, in the old days of Sky Sports News, they used to have a camera that went all the way from the back of the studio right over to the front, and you'd see the back of the presenter's sort of desk. Okay. And you'd see the back of their heads. So I wore it for the very first shot at seven o'clock in the morning. But I think at that stage it was an Adidas shirt and the show was sponsored by Nike. Oh. <laughs> so we had like frantic phone calls going, tell her to get it off, take it off. So, yeah, I have. So I have ha I have one and I've still got it. But um, yeah, I've never bought one. Because the assumption would be when you're a kid and you're around Liverpool and, you know, you see John Barnes or Ian Rush that you're going up saying, any chance of a jersey? Or was that not was that not the done thing for the manager's daughter? No, well, at that stage, when, when I was at the age of being the manager's daughter, I was not encouraged to kind of hang around the footballers. In fact, quite the opposite. <laughs> it was, you come into the office after any event. I mean, I, was, right. I would have been young. I was like 14, 13, 14, and, yeah. and then a little bit older. After. But it was, no, 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 you come into the office, you come and stand with us and, and stay, clear of, stay clear of everybody. But yeah, so um, yeah, it wasn't, it wasn't really a, um, a mingling opportunity. <laughs> <laughs> right. You obviously grew up um, with your father always being famous, so you were used to being around football, but would you have been, as a as a young child, starstruck by being in and around Liverpool dressing rooms, Blackburn dressing rooms, or was it just normal life? It, it's different because the first, my first experience of footballers were as my mum and dad's friends, and it was like, it was as much I would see the wives and kids as I would the footballers, so, it, you know, when, when it's your dad's, workmates they're not really that interesting so that's that's kind of how I first saw footballers and then it also footballers weren't they weren't what they are now they weren't celebrities in the same way they were footballers just that was that was what they did so there wasn't that same kind of um there wasn't that same kind of glamour around them I suppose I mean they'd, be, they'd probably be horrified to think they weren't glamorous but yeah, yeah, yeah I remember I remember going to something once it was like a charity match and George Best was there and kind of being a bit like oh my god that's George Best because he was legendary George Best yeah exactly <laughs> and then I, I mean I, no there's, there's nobody really that I thought and I did I did a little sort of couple of minute interview with David Beckham once and I was a bit like oh it's David Beckham but like not it's I just don't think about footballers in that way. Yeah, it's uh, probably a good thing in the job you're in as well. You don't want to be like <laughs> yeah, Neville and Cara have a imagine bit of ego. Imagine if they came over <laughs> and Every I was like, oh my God, I can't amazing. believe I'm working with you guys again. Yeah, oh, they'd love it. <laughs> so what age are you then when you realise your dad is a little bit different to all the other dads? Quite young. Um because we was all, we were always kind of aware of it, but where we grew up, it wasn't it wasn't a big deal because we were there all the time, and so people were just like sick of the sight of him. But I remember going to um, a Rod Stewart concert when I was a kid, and I would be I think I was about nine, and we went it was at Ibrox, and we went there, and as we were walking around the inside of like in, in, on the inside track bit to get round to our seats. People were stopping and asking my dad for like, it was autographs. It wasn't pictures then. It was like for autographs. And my mom's like that, oh, for Christ's sake, come on, come on. And she was just like dragging me, just bloody leave him. <laughs> leave him to it. <laughs> He'll catch up with us. So, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that was, that was the first time it ever really, um, it ever really 
not affected my life, but that I ever really noticed it. Yeah, it, it must be something now, and because the love is still there uh, around Liverpool in particular and around Celtic as well, that now you can look at and go, wow, like this is, not everybody has this, that the warmth of an entire people towards one person that your dad brings out of generations of Liverpool supporters. It's its a weird thing in lots of ways, but like it's such a special thing for him and I guess your family to have. Yeah, and what's really lovely about it is we've had different generations of it. So he was there as, as player and manager. And, and then that was sort of, that was so much part of everyday life that you didn't you didn't really notice it then because that was just how it was and how it had always been. But then particularly at, at Liverpool, when he went back the second time, there was just such a lovely warmth around it. And it was, it was, um, my mum said, you know, they, they'd go out for dinner and people who they'd known for years would suddenly come over and go, would you mind if we had a picture or would you mind? And she's like, he's, he's the same person he was last week. <laughs> he's no more interesting than he was yeah. last week. And then, um, but there was it, but the culture around football had changed. And then when he got the stand named after him and we went to the game and we went to the ground and it was, that was all really lovely. So you see, you you get a different perspective on it from, from that way that, because when he was playing and then managing there, it was all just normal life. But to go back again has been, has been really lovely. You see it differently. Football has transformed even a field since, Kenny left Liverpool the second time and even the toxic side of it. And when he went back as manager the second time, I guess you were at a stage you were working around football, but also Twitter was around, you were online, you would see the comments if a result didn't go well. It was very different, I'd imagine, to when he was in charge first time around where someone might say something on the street, but you wouldn't be reading it on your phone for four or five hours a day. How did you find it being a bit older and him going back as Liverpool manager and, and probably you being far more aware of any criticism you would get than he was? Yeah, and I was I was not comfortable at all with, with him going back I, because you know what's coming because it doesn't matter that it, it's one of those things where mostly that I mean look you look at Liverpool now you look at what's happening with Jurgen Klopp and there's still people online moaning and you just think right well you can't get away from it so I just didn't look at it I didn't look at the social media stuff I just didn't pay any attention to it because. You just can't, you just can't engage with it because you're not engaging with rational people a lot of the time, you know, and it's not, I don't mean that people, I don't mean people who would go online and moan about a bad performance or a bad result. I mean, just some people are just, um, they're just fixated. There's a real kind of, um, I don't know, they just get stuck in this sort of negative spiral and you see it with, you see it with everything. It's the kind of, um, it's the sort of Messi and Ronaldo-fication of, of football where everything has to be polar opposites. Everything has mm. to be extreme. Somebody has to be the best. You can't just have a favourite. You've got to have the best. And it's it's all just a bit aggressive and pointless, I think. And so much of it has become like that and a lot of media coverage has become like that. When you're now presenting on Sky, is that to the forefront of your mind when you're presenting the coverage of not getting balance because maybe balance isn't always perfect either, but bringing an extra layer of depth to it that it's not just, well, Cristiano Ronaldo's this or Cristiano Ronaldo's that. There's a, a level of analysis that I think Sky do so brilliantly with Neville and, and Carragher in particular. Is it something you have to spend a lot of time thinking about that actually we don't want to be totally divisive here? Yeah, I think, I think particularly if it's um, one of those stories that everybody's had their say on, it, whatever, whatever it might be, you, you're kind of always looking for another way to, to come at it. Well, because I think, there are, say, oh, I don't know, say, for example, say Brighton last season. The, the big story with Brighton was they have this huge XG and hardly any goals. Brighton can't score goals. That was the story. And it, it just felt, particularly because there were so many games that were live last season, and I seem to do a lot of Brighton ones, and we'd always talk about Eve Basuma, and it would always be Brighton can't score goals, and here's Eve Basuma. And... In some ways, that is the that is the biggest story. That was the, the main talking point. But you're always trying to find slightly different ways to, to go at them. So, you know, you get people in with knowledge of Brighton, say, well, what are the options? Who can they use? What, how can they, they turn this around? Or, you know, is this just something that's going to naturally come to an end because, you know, the stats can't keep going on like this forever, whatever it might be. So you, you're constantly just trying to get a, a slightly fresher angle on what might be, a story that's that's really done the rounds. 
what's the process behind that? Uh, obviously, I'd be nerdish about this and <laughs> wanting to know, wanting to learn, but uh, how much influence do you have on the talking points? How much influence do the pundits have, the producers behind the scenes? I assume it's a collaborative project, but would you go in quite often quite passionate about things that you feel need to be discussed? I think it would more, I think often the, the main stories are, are are the obvious ones. And certainly, you know, I do a lot of the, uh, Fridays and Saturdays. So the Fridays are a bit more um, broad in terms of their their scope. Uh, it's more of a magazine type build up. So there really isn't time for that sort of depth of analysis on a on a Friday. Saturdays we've got half an hour and we're we're sort of straight into it. But often it's it's driven by the pundits. So you know it it's um, because there's no point in me saying unless unless the producer or I sort of think this is something we really want to get to the bottom of but if you've got um if you've got a pundit who goes oh, I don't really think there's anything in that there's not much point in asking them it on air because you're not going to get an interesting answer and the whole point of it is to get interesting answers from them so mm. it might be that we have somebody in who has a special connection to Watford for example and they come in and say no 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 you know the ever-changing style of football at Watford well what they're going to do now because I know the manager is X, Y, and Z, and this is how they're going to use the players, and these are the ones that are going to benefit. So a lot of it's driven by them because the whole point of it is to get their expertise. That's that's kind of the starting point for everything. Yeah. One of the highlights already of this season, I think, was the first night of the season and where Friday night work, football works so well, where you get the sense that everybody at Brentford might have had a drink or two before the game had started, <laughs> and then they get this sensational result against Arsenal. And... I guess that's why you're so good at your job in that you just let it flow, that actually you just stand back and say, this is a bit crazy. This is not in the script. The manager's coming over. There's people in the stands. Carragher never in the stands. And you just got to run with it and enjoy it. But it's like it's exactly like like you said, the story there. I mean, we, we did reflect on Arsenal's performance and Arsenal's defending in particular. and that, But it wasn't the story. You know, the story was football's back. We've got fans in. We've got... A, promoted side beating Arsenal it was and and what was what was nice about that is it had all been set up from the beginning because the Brentford fans were really confident because in a way they had the best possible start because you have a, a team with as big a name as Arsenal but who were as beatable as Arsenal so you, mm. you kind of get the the best of both worlds there and it was just it was just so lovely I mean there was a part of me walking into the ground that was as it started to get full that was getting quite anxious about seeing everybody really close together and and then they start singing hey jude and it just it was just really lovely after you know that whole season where we barely saw a supporter inside the grounds and it felt so sterile and we got used to it because you do and then it came back in in the best way and you just think that's this is the whole point of it you know as much as we want to sit and get all the analysis right and we and we try to do that and try to get the stories right sometimes it's just about the emotion of it and you can't ever forget that I think mm. did you always want to work in football nope um no <laughs> I not until about I don't know a couple of months before I left uni um I was doing a maths degree and that was I was sort of thinking about jobs in that area not with much enthusiasm <laughs> And um, Sky Sports News was starting up. So I was like, well, I could go and speak to them and see how it is. And at that stage, they just screen tested everybody. And at the time, I thought, oh, God, they've seen they've seen something in me. You know, this is, they, they want to put me on screen. But really, what they were doing was using my dad's name to publicize right. this brand new channel. But, you know, 22, I was starry eyed and thought this was this was my moment. Um, yeah. So I just, but where I was really lucky with that was that, well, lucky again with that was that Sky Sports News wasn't available to for anybody to watch. It literally went out around the building for the first few months. And so you, we just got thousands and thousands of hours under our belts of live TV and live TV working with a load of kids basically in their early 20s who were practicing who were getting all their practical experience together and so we'd all make mistakes and so you learn to cover up or move on or gloss over things and it was just it, looking back on it it was such a brilliant learning experience and it was just 
It was just really, really good fun. So were you able to move on quite quickly then from maybe the family name has got me in here to actually I belong here for myself? Yeah, I, I'm not sure. I don't know. I don't, I don't think you can ever kind of leave it behind completely because it's a fact. You know, it's it's how it's how it worked. But then all you can do with the opportunity is sort of take it and, and work hard with it. And yeah. then I think by the time I left, Sky Sports because I was there for nearly nine years so by the time I left I was I was sort of relatively confident that I could do the job nine years in <laughs> yeah <laughs> just up to nine years <laughs> like the hard work is the key I guess because you can't fake that side of it and we had Gary Neville on the show a couple of years ago and he was talking about becoming a pundit and yeah. I think it was, he was at Roy Keane and Keem was sort of saying at that stage he wasn't oh, fully committed. <laughs> he wasn't fully committed at that stage, and Roy obviously changed his mind. I think about two weeks later he signed his contract with Sky, <laughs> where he decided to go full time. But Gary Neville was making a point: you can't just pick. You can't turn up for Liverpool, Manchester United, and three months later do Manchester United, Manchester City. Like this is every week. You've got to be absolutely committed. And by the sounds of it, that's what you were. That, that even though you had the name, you weren't really looking to take any shortcuts here. You knew that this is a weekends, unsociable hours, all of that, and you just got on with the gig. Oh yeah, but then, but then my my whole life had been weekends and unsociable hours because that's that's that was my dad's yeah. job. So I was used to you know him maybe not being there for a lot of Christmas Day or things like that. So when I had to work Christmas, it was like, oh, it's not ideal. But you know, there's people because I was younger at the time as well, there were people with kids. So I was like, well, it's more important that they have Christmas with their families and that, uh, you know, this is this is what you do when you're young and you're, you're starting out or like 4 a.m. starts or whatever they were and, and that kind of thing. That's, it's, yeah, you do it. You put the hours in. And the thing with, the thing with football is that the best hours are not the most sociable hours. The most interesting times to work are at antisocial hours. It's weekends and Christmas and night times and early mornings, whenever it is. But, they're the they're the best times to work, so you you get it back. Yeah, it, like from the outside, obviously your childhood sounds like the greatest childhood of all time. You're growing up in Kenny Dalglish's house, but as you say, he is in a job firstly as a player, then as a player manager, and as a manager at one of the biggest clubs in world football, and he's not always there. Uh, yeah. that was just something I guess you're always used to. That actually, he's got two priorities here. Yeah, somebody was asking me about this the other day, and I was like, I don't remember him being away a lot, but he right. clearly was away a lot. But then I don't really remember him being there either. <laughs> it was just kind of <laughs> like background noise. I don't know. I suppose, I suppose it would take years of therapy to kind of try and unpick it. And but I think, I think it was just it was accepted. I think, I think kids are so adaptable that you give them a set of circumstances, and you go, here's here's your life. Mum was at home all the time. Dad was away and home and away and home and but then he but then in other ways you know he'd finish training in the early afternoon and come home so he'd be there when we got back from school in the week so you know he he wasn't working Monday to Friday long hours he, but he was working weekends and and holidays so yeah it was he, it, it was just it was just a sort of fact of life I suppose yeah I'd say pre Hillsborough and everything that followed was he affected by the results? Would everyone in the house know on a, a Saturday night? In fairness, results were generally pretty good. <laughs> so yeah, it, and it, it so there is that. But then, yeah, but 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 he would more be, and certainly as a manager, he was more affected by um, performances than results. So they could win, and you'd be coming home in the car, and he'd be in a foul mood, and all the way home, you'd be like that. Oh god but and it's like Chris this is what he's like when they've won <laughs> and we'd always be sitting moaning in the back seat and um but yeah it, it was it was performances because I think that's the thing he could control results you can't really control but the performances you can so that's what would would wind him up if there was a bad performance you did a brilliant documentary for the BBC on Hillsborough where I think you spoke a little bit about your own experience but mostly uh, with the families and with your dad and for anyone who hasn't heard it I think you can get it on the BBC app but you know it finishes I think you say thanks dad and it's in that manner of you know he's opened up maybe in a way he hadn't previously uh, that because you were at Hillsborough uh, with, yeah. with your brother as well like that day is that the day in your life that stands out above all others that changed everything for your family um, I mean, yeah, you could, you could definitely, 
you could definitely say that. Um, I, I'm not sure if it if it stands out or if it stands it it sort of stands alone. I think it's it's kind of um, I think it cha it changed everything for for a lot of people. I think and you know I always worry talking about it that you know, because my because my experience of it was nothing compared to the experience of people who lost family members of people who were there of people who still live with with the effects of it and people who've died as a result of of Hillsborough later later in their lives and it just turned it turned people's lives completely upside down and people are still still fighting for that now still still mm. now it was 1989 and they're, and they're still fighting and I find that extraordinary and it still makes me it still makes me really really angry that that nobody properly has been held to account for it it, it just I, I think there there is there is the the issue of somebody being made to take responsibility for Hillsborough itself, but I think it also has huge repercussions for crowd safety in any situation. If there are no if there are no repercussions, if nobody is held accountable for this, then it feels more likely that it that it will happen again. Even though there have been safety improvements in the grounds as a result of Hillsborough. It does feel as though over the last few years that every time there's been a step forward and there have been some big steps forward towards justice, it's just taken away again. And for the families, every time I would imagine it's brought up, they're reminded and the stress and the strain of that. Like it is just this huge burden on the city that anytime you, you go to Liverpool, you go around Anfield, you can almost still feel it. Your dad was on the show with us last year and you know he gave a, a similar answer. And I think it's his always been his way of, Yes, I suffered, but again, compared to the families of the 97 victims, we haven't really. But even still for you, if you're, what are you, you're teenage years, these are pretty formative years. There's firstly the impact of you're at the ground, but also you're having to watch as your, your dad and I guess your mom as well are, are going through this just most terrible of experience that nothing can prepare you for, that nobody can take you aside and say, here's how you deal with something like this. Like, that, that's, that's a lot to go through as a teenager. Yeah, and it was everywhere. You know, it it wasn't it it's I know I know you're saying that if you go to, to Liverpool now or you're around Anfield now, there is always a, a presence. Um and at the time, you know, it was assemblies in school about it, then it was in the papers, it was on the news. Mum and dad were at funerals pretty much every day. They I think they went to over half of the of the, the funerals, which would have been the, yeah, would have been 95 at, at the time. I think um so they they were they, that was them for for a couple of weeks they were if they weren't at the funerals then they were in Anfield and talking to families talking to people who just wanted to come to the ground um so it it was it was it was all consuming not just that day but but all around that time but that's not to say that that was a bad thing I think sometimes when um you you're part of something even if it's at a at a slight distance, if you're part of something that feels that huge, there's something quite comforting in being around other people to whom it is maybe even more important. Mm. And it it that was that was helpful, I think, for mum and dad, I think, to to be in in and around the the ground like that. Paul and I went in one day. We weren't there. We, we were twelve and thirteen, and. We went, we went in and Paul tied a teddy bear on the on the on the goal at the cop end. And we walked along the cop and we saw the, all the tributes. So, but the but the atmosphere, it felt it was it was incredibly moving, incredibly moving. And and also it just I, it felt right, I think. It felt like the right thing to do. Your dad is a, a reluctant hero at the best of times, I think. But when he talks about Hillsborough, say, he sort of uh, moves it to one side. But like of all the things he has achieved, I'd imagine as a family, the pride with how he handled that, and and how you as a family handled that, because I'm sure your your mom was a huge part of that 
as well in supporting you as kids and supporting him as a husband that you got through that as a family and also the leadership that the entire family showed throughout the years yeah I think I think my mum's role in all of it was as you say was was huge as well because like you said she's kind of managing her family two of whom were there on the day and then two little ones as well um my sister would have been a baby at the time my younger sister and at the same time sort of supporting my dad and you know as most men of that generation and and upbringing are not a talker about his feelings or you know not not somebody who's gonna who's gonna give very much away about it so yeah I think her what 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 she did was was incredible and I think there was um I think I think that you know we, we didn't talk about it a lot at the time but I think from from what we've talked about since and from what dad has said since I think there was I th- I think um, that because he understood it, because he understood the club, because he understood the fans, because he understood the families, that I think he was able to say and do the right things that were what people needed at the time, because he knew them. They were, you know, there was there was a connection there, and that's why they knew what to do. I think. Yeah. I, I, I can't imagine uh, in terms of his footballing career there's any regrets. It's interesting listening to Alex Ferguson uh, since his retirement. And I won't say he wishes he'd retired earlier, but probably it funnily came around to what he had missed because of his utter commitment to Manchester United. It, did you get the sense ever from your dad that there was a bit of, geez, I did miss uh, all those Christmas days. I did miss all those Christmas days. No, 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 not, not that. But, oh my God, like with his grandchildren, he's, it's, it, I mean... It's as though they're miracles because he never saw his own kids reach a lot of the <laughs> milestones. So he's suddenly just like, oh my god, are they, they're, that's very uh, that's really early for them to be talking, isn't it? Isn't it? That's like, oh my, can you believe they're doing that already? Look at the way, look at the way he kicks that ball. I mean, that's he, I mean, he's only he's only small, and you're like, you know, you know, you know, we did all that. <laughs> you know, yeah, yeah, you know yeah. we all learned to do all that. It's like you just, but also it wasn't even. I mean, that wasn't even just that he wasn't there. That was because he was at, like a dad in the late seventies, yeah. early eighties. It was like that's what? that wasn't his. Yeah, that wasn't his remit. <laughs> yeah, that's that's uh, that's fair enough. Were you uh, when he went back, uh, which we touched on already? But were you concerned in any way when he went back to Liverpool? Yeah, yeah, because I think because I think when somebody's seen in the way that he was seen at Liverpool before he went back, there's there's a, it feels like there's only one way it can go um but I think he felt like he could help and I think what he did although you know he'll he'll say it himself about like the league position but just getting to Wembley and winning a trophy I mean as hard fought as it was against Cardiff but he got to go and do that my daughter was uh three and she got she got to go to Wembley and see her grandpa win a trophy and You know, I've got a great picture of it with the with the medal. He, she's kind of playing with his medal around his neck, and it was just, you know, so that I think, and it's that's not just our family. There were there were kids who hadn't been to Wembley in years who were like who were there. So I think he feels that even though that probably wouldn't rank outside as one of his biggest achievements, I think it felt like a sea change. I think the club needed that at the time. It needed to be kind of, I don't know, brought back to what it was. And then I think that kind of that helped to turn the tide a little bit and for, yeah. for what came next. The emotional, and listen, maybe you've been at Brentford, which is a brand new stadium. You can see what football could do to people. I was going to say, do you get a sense that the emotional side of the game is almost more important to Liverpool than it is? And Liverpool supporters in the majority? Um or is that just bias? I'm not sure. I'm not I'm not sure about the supporters, because I think all supporters have that. I think that very, very, very broadly speaking, I think Liverpool's a very sentimental city. I think that I think the sort of Irish influence in Liverpool is is really clear. I think you see it as Celtic as well. Mm. Um, that it is about the songs and the history. I mean, look, I, I know I'm talking about lots of clubs and people get really annoyed because they're like, Christ, they're talking about it like it's special or it's different. But they're Celtic has it, and and there there are a couple of other clubs as well. But there is, 
there is something about that kind of unashamed emotion and that unashamed sentiment that I think is unusual definitely I don't think it's I don't think it's unique to Liverpool like I said I think Celtic has it as well but it's but it's uh it, it's it's unusual definitely so these talented grandkids uh are they going to play for <laughs> Scotland or England <laughs> if it's mine mine one mine won't represent anyone in sport. <laughs> they're, they're lovely kids but I don't think that's where they're that's where their future lies um I would push mine into into Scotland but I yeah look they'll play for yeah. whoever picks them wouldn't they yeah yeah uh you know how these things work we got to get the views on this so Kelly Rankus uh <laughs> one to four Roy Keane Mika Richards Gary Neville Jamie Carragher in terms of your favorite pundits <laughs> No, I can't. And the reason the reason I can't is because I think that they would care and they don't care because it's what I think of them. They care because they never lose that competition. They never lose that right. competitive spirit. And genuinely, whatever it is, they all want to come out on top of each other in. So, ah, yeah. uh, so I can't. I just can't. I think I think I'd have to maybe go. <laughs> I'd have to maybe go through in terms of who I thought it would matter most to, and I, I, I mean again, that's <laughs> who would that's who would it matter most to? <laughs> well, that's what that's what I don't know. It'd matter most to them in different. Roy because he just wants to win. Um, Gary because he likes Gary because he likes to think he's the best. <laughs> uh, Cara would pretend not to care, but maybe would. And Mike is quite sensitive, so I think yeah, it would hurt Mike's feelings if he wasn't yeah. if he wasn't at the top. So yeah, that's why I couldn't rank them. Uh, you, uh, I'd imagine, and you definitely get the sense, are loving the Roy Micah bromance as much <laughs> as the Jamie Gary bromance. It's it's just there's such a lovely balance to it. I think they, I think when it works really really well, they bring out the best in each other. So there's a um, Micah gives a real warmth to Roy, and I think Roy gives Micah a little bit of steel in the in the argument. And I think that's a really lovely thing to have when when you have them kind of balancing each other out because it, it each one makes the other one better i think but the bromance the bromance my god who'd have picked who'd have picked micah and roy wow. <laughs> who was that producer who was that, that guy deserves a raise I know. I know although to be honest i think that almost could be just micah going in one day and going no nah, i'm not i'm not having this come on roy come on because roy like you've worked with him like roy on air is not the same as Roy off air. No. You know, I know. I suppose actually when he did your show, he actually was. <laughs> <laughs> well, there was a couple of moments. Yeah, off air, yeah. he couldn't have been nicer. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's, it's a very different, it, you know, and, and so sometimes you kind of, I know um, writer Ian Wright says that sometimes, that he comes on air giggling when he's working with him because he's funny off air. And then he sees the countdown clock going and he goes, puts his serious face on. So he kind of, yeah, so he's usually chuckling at Roy as well. What's next then, Kelly? What's the ambition? Oh, I don't know. I'm, it's I'm a quite dangerous thing in media, with... isn't it? Talking about yeah, your ambitions. I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm quite, I'm quite happy with what I'm doing at the moment. You know, sort of um, Premier League football, bit of radio, which lets me cover the EFL and the Champions League. And, um, you know, then I can wander off and do World Cups and Euros and things. So I don't, I don't, you know, I, I, I'm sort of, I'm, I'm nervous to wish for any more because I quite like things as they are. Well, that's so, a, a good yeah. place to be in life, isn't it? Yeah, I think so. I think so. Uh, look, it's been a real pleasure to talk to you. Uh, we loved watching you and listening as well. And I hope to continue to do so for many years to come. Uh, thanks many, right, Kelly. Nathan. Thanks so much, Nathan. I'd, I'd like to retire at some stage, though. I'm getting on now. <laughs> <laughs> not just yet. Not just yet. <laughs> Roy, Roy and Michael retire, yeah, I'd say, at some stage. <laughs> All right, it is Thursday's football show. Nathan with you for the next hour. We've got Kelly Cates coming up in just a little while, going to chat about her career and also obviously about growing up in the Dugleash household. So that coming your way, uh, well worth tuning in for that. But Joe Malloy is on the line of a th- late of a Thursday evening. I was presumed you were doing very exciting things at this time of a Thursday night, Joe. Well, I am. I'm talking to you. Kelly Cates, good to have one good broadcaster on the hey, football show. That's there you go. Kelly. Uh, World's nicest person, Kelly Gates. Really? I was uh, recording this earlier, and afterwards I came out, and JP said, I haven't seen you as happy doing an interview in a long, long time. If one of these people you feel like you're friends with by the end of the interview, or straight away, the second you start, she's just such a familiar face as well. Uh, yeah, and just such an interesting story. And I guess, like a lot of broadcasters, Joe, certainly like me, maybe not like you, not entirely comfortable 
always talking about herself. I was a bit wary of talking too much about Kenny Dugleish, but actually much happier to talk about Kenny than actually to talk about her own uh, experiences. But uh, yeah, really good at what she does and always comes across as though she really enjoys what she does. Really good. Totally agree. Walks a nice line between let's actually try and analyse the game for people. Let's ask questions about why someone didn't play well. But also, I think you get a sense she's there to enjoy herself as well. Like, it's sport. We should be having a good time when we can. So she's very good. Very polished as well, Nathan. No more so than yourself, but she's very polished. I'm not just saying this now because Sky sponsor uh, all our football (laughs) coverage. But their football coverage over the last three, four years has gone up several notches in terms of getting that balance of it is football, it's live, it's anything can happen we're at a crowded stadium Brentford was maybe the best example of that on the opening night of the season where they totally got the importance of like what a shambles Arsenal were and we reflected that but also like this was Brentford the first night the crowd is going wild Carragher and Neville are in the crowd and also then with Monday Night Football again understanding the importance of the game that's happening but just the depth of analysis has been sort of groundbreaking for football it is off the charts I totally agree with you I think for a lot of the 90s and the early 2000s, we had the panel, I suppose, primarily. And I think we looked on the quality over in England with a certain sympathy, like we have the best punditry by a mile. And I think Sky, more so really than any other channel, I like I've put everybody else in the shade, to be honest, because they have the tactical genius of Neville in particular, I think it is Neville in particular, but Carragher's not far behind him increasingly so on a Monday. Like that has been revolutionary. You watch thing, you watch games on a Monday back through their prism and you're like, oh my God, I didn't see that. And it's just so obvious now. So that's phenomenal. And the other area they've really overtaken us over here, I think we've gone, I don't know, is it like a reaction to the RT panel, which, you know, when it was at its rambunctious best was really like knifey and strong comment. Mm. I think we've gone a little bit too soft over here at times, whereas Neville, like Keen, there's a reason they've gone for Keen. Soonest really goes for it. The rows they have now, they have properly good rows over there and they properly go for people. And I like, it's hard to know how it's happened. I think social media has played a role. Like they realize, oh my God, if Keen goes off on one, it gets 10 gazillion views. And so what broadcaster is going to turn away from that? But like they've really gone from it because you'd remember there was definitely a time where Sunus would come over here and he'd say oh well god I can say so much over here you can't say it over there because the clubs give the broadcasters grief when they're at we send their you know our reporters to their press conferences and you know word gets back and it just gets difficult the relationship gets difficult I don't know what I don't know why it's happened I I do think social media is part of it but Mm. in the last three four years five years maybe Sky is definitely very loud and not afraid to really criticize and like so you mix all that together geez that's pretty damn good in fairness i think it's been incredible the last couple of years well i was saying to kelly cates the producer who put roy Keane and micah richards together deserves a massive pay rise because Mm -hmm. richards adds so much and i think allows sooness and Keane in particular to get away with so much because of the way he lightens it so Keane is going all in, all in. And you think back to Keane going all in when Richards wasn't in the studio. There is that awkwardness of Roy Keane demolishing yeah. somebody. But he can still demolish someone. But Richards can sort of take the sting out of it a little bit and I think makes it more palatable for everybody. It means actually you can put this up on social media, particularly at the moment where you, know, you need to be careful at how you talk about players. And Roy at times still isn't careful that actually Richards just makes it acceptable for Roy to be Roy. Yeah, I agree. And I think when Roy's at his terrifying best, it's terrifying in person. Uh, but not for Mika, really. He's not uncomfortable by it. He cracks a joke. And like, Keane has such a good sense of humor. Like his comic timing, like, you, you know, whatever your views on him, he's, he's hilarious. And he has the ability to go from incredibly angry and critical and snap right into humor in an instant. And thankfully, I think Richards is there to prompt that because obviously Keane's not going to initiate it, maybe. And if everybody is ashen faced and looking at their feet in the studio, then it's just going to stay a bit awkward. But yeah, like it's it's brilliant. And like, my God, the week of the European Super League on that Mm. station with Neville from the Sunday afternoon when news broke through to Monday night football when he basically organized an uprising. Yeah, like, geez, I mean, we were of an age where you probably thought, God, Andy Gray and Richard Keyes will be a loss. 
man, they've they've uh, they've just gone off to a different level. I still think Gray is a loss as a co-commentator. And I watch back Premier League years. He's, he's very good, yeah. Ah, oh, just top class of nailing the moment. Always yeah. been able to nail the big moment, and so many of the. This iconic goals, you always think of Gray's reaction as much as with Martin Tyler's commentary. It is Gray nailing that line straight after us. The Steven Gerrard goals good. are the ones that, that yeah. stand out more than any other. Uh, He's very good at that. I would still take Neville over him because the way Neville drops in some tactical stuff during a game, I think Gray wasn't quite doing that, to be fair. But I agree with you. Like, geez, when, the, when, when you needed a good line off Martin Tyler calling the goal... Gray was better than anyone at that, I'd say. Like, he's the best at that, mm. wasn't he? Oh, absolutely. And it's, again, never sounded rehearsed, never sounded pre-prepared. He just did it time after time and rarely repeated himself. Rarely repeated yeah. himself. Always had a little twist on it. Here, Joe, listen, we're pretty good as well, it's got to be said. Like, you know, we're trying our best here. Trying our best. Where is this going? There's a punchline here. There's not. There's not. <laughs> I just had to wrap it up, Jim. He's like, come All on, right, sorry, go on. move on with it. Uh, Premier League is back this weekend, of course. Uh, starts Saturday, half 12, Watford against Liverpool. Uh, the crazy situation where tonight the Brazilian players are playing, so therefore are probably unlikely going to be available for Liverpool against Watford at half 12 on Saturday. I uh, will have full coverage throughout Saturday with John and the lads. Obviously, they're reflecting a lot on Ireland as well but some big games on Saturday afternoon uh, Manchester United away to Leicester unquestionably the biggest of them United starting run of Leicester uh, Liverpool Tottenham and City in their next four league games and some big Champions League matches in there as well and uh, Manchester City also in action at 3 o'clock on Saturday against Burnley and then we have our double header here on Off the Ball on Sunday it's going to be Dave McIntyre and Brian Kerr Goodison Park Everton against West Ham and then at half past four it'll be myself and Jack Byrne on co-commentary on Sunday uh, for Newcastle against Tottenham it is a strange one even still to think about the commentary and how you talk about Newcastle because already you've been sort of swept up in the who's the next manager going to be who are they going to sign and I heard uh, Daniel Harrison on OTBAM this morning I thought he was you know, very strong on how good these owners are sort of weaponising supporters to be behind them and suddenly you can't say anything about Newcastle and their ownership or the entire Newcastle fan base will jump down their throat. But by the time the match starts, it's, it's, how many times he, are we going to bring up Saudi Arabia during the commentary? I don't know. How many Twice times should he bring up Saudi Arabia during the commentary? Twice a half, I think. Twice a half. I don't know. 15 minutes and 35 you and Jack, minutes. You, you and Jack Byrne, two technicians there. Well, that will Tell be. you what. That will be interesting. Quiven Kelleher is likely to start for Liverpool on the Saturday, by the way, because of the... Mm international situation you can see when Wenger is talking about a biennial World Cup and fewer international windows i.e. one maybe in October and one in March we have a very Eurocentric view of football like our lads hop on a flight from Heathrow and they're here in an hour I can see how all the South American countries and all the players would be like hang on one international window across the season sign me up it's like there are merits to the Wenger thing actually I know it sounded initially uh, ludicrous but uh, those boys driving back on Friday mornings outrageous. Um, yeah, Newcastle. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. It's um, it's very tricky. Like the more you hear people make very strong arguments against Saudi Arabia, like um, Ollie Holt, I'd say had some tweets from Newcastle fans. Like the headline on his piece in the Mail on Sunday uh, talked about you know everyone's welcome if they have enough money, including murderers. You know there was no mincing of words in the English press on Sunday. How often you mention it? From time to time, I suppose it's um tricky like there's going to be a great anti-climax for the first few weeks when literally nothing changes about Newcastle <laughs> no <laughs> no, no. And, well the manager I guess is the one if Conte pitched up in a week that'll be something yeah but it'll still be Joel Linton up front yeah. <laughs> that, that's not going to change pre-Christmas no and you know the players they've been linked with like it's very of that era that we were talking about oh it's very Manchester it's, City it is I always yeah. go back to that yellow ticker that day that Manchester City were bought and it was Manchester City are interested in I think it was Lionel Messi Carlos Tevez and Rubinho and they signed Rubinho and they never got Lionel Messi in the end and he just say it was a slow trickle of kind of good Premier League players from the middle ranking teams that the other top four don't want I think it'll be five years more of being linked with the Lingards of the world and the Martials of the world and that'll get them up into top seven top eight and then they'll make the jump maybe uh, my headphones have just gone off there sorry about that but I'm sure you said something very insightful once again uh, Joe great stuff Golf Weekly is up Golf Weekly is up as well for anybody who missed it. Uh, masterclass in uh, Golf Weekly broadcasting this afternoon. Get on to otbsports.com forward slash Golf Weekly. Thanks for that, Joe. All Talk right, to you on Sunday. Bye. 
All right, quick break. Kelly Kate's up next.